yesterday's prophecies for today's world. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. The Holy Spirit dwells in every believer, and he is in you, and you need not be afraid. And now, Hal Lindsey's Bible study of the book of John. Let's turn to John chapter 8 now. The title is uh, twofold. First, the light of the world and the two fatherhoods of mankind. That's the subject and focus of this chapter. Now, you've seen uh, when I did John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39 particularly, you saw how that Jesus seized upon some custom that the Israelites had that was very important to them and something they, they uh, repeated year after year. And uh, it was a custom that involved expressing their great hope that the Messiah would come. And in the case there in John chapter 7, it was, the, it was on the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, that was the time when uh, the priest in full dress uniform would march out with trumpets blaring and uh, the priesthood singing. And uh, they would take a silver pitcher, take water out of the pool of Siloam, take it back to the brazen altar in the temple and the whole the whole city with uh, visitors be a, a million people there at least on this high holy day and the whole city would be trying to follow behind them trying to get points of view where they can hear up on the temple walls and everything and the priest would come back and he would hold up the pitcher but before he would pour it there would as he raised his arm there would be a, almost an eerie silence take place immediately because that's when all of those present would pray that the Messiah would come and, as Isaiah predicted, would pour out the water of the Holy Spirit on the dry desert, that the desert might bloom like a rose, and in the same way he would pour out his Spirit on the people of Israel. And remember, it was at that moment during that silence, they were praying for the Messiah to come. He would pour out the Holy Spirit that Jesus leaped up and shouted, and I'm sure he could be heard for a mile. He le leaped up and shouted, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He that believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit who was not yet given. And... Uh, so he seized upon a very important uh, ceremony that was practiced year after year and said, I am the one who has fulfilled that. I am the Messiah. Now in John chapter 8, after this brief interlude of him dealing with a trumped up uh, adultery plot that they tried to trap him with, he is still at the temple, and uh, he hasn't left after that situation that took place during the midday. And remember, in, in uh, the Jewish calendar, when does a new day start? Sundown. And at sundown, everyone would still stay there. The place would be teeming with worshipers. And uh, at sundown, there began what was called the octave of the, the great feast season, which is the eighth day, the day after the highlight of the Feast of Tabernacles. But it was still a great celebration, and they had a custom that was even more important than what had happened that day. They would light the great candelabras 
of the temple and raise it up, and it would be so bright that it would shine all over the surrounding hills of Jerusalem. They would light all of these candelabras, and this was a time that they, uh, the, the eighth day was the end of the feast, and this is when they would open it with the phrase from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, where God predicted of the Messiah, he said, it is too light of a thing for you to be my servant, to raise up the fallen of Jacob and to, uh, to uh, bring salvation to the preserved ones of Israel. Behold, I will give you also as a light to the Gentiles that my salvation may extend to the ends of the earth. That's why they lighted all of these candelabras and everyone would be rejoicing. It was a, it was a time of great joy. And uh, they, the Mishnah had a lot of things about the significance of the lighting of those candelabras and how it related to the coming of the Messiah. And they, in the Mishnah, which is one of the great teaching books and records of the interpretations of the rabbis of the Torah and the prophets, they, in the Mishnah, they had it written that this was to uh, look forward to the great hope of the Messiah coming as the light of the world. Now, you can just imagine how Jesus took advantage of that. Reading from one of the best sources of information about the Gospels, this is from a converted rabbi named Alfred Edersheim. Alfred Edersheim... Uh, was uh, a rabbi until, oh, I guess he was around 35 years old. And he was also a, an Oxford scholar at the University of Oxford when he was overwhelmed by the evidence of the scripture that Jesus had to be the Messiah. And so he became a believer. And after that, he brought that great knowledge that he had as a rabbi. And he wrote two volumes, and they're called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Edersheim. Now, you can probably get that through Amazon, but it's one of the best uh, sets of studies I've ever seen that fills in the historical background of the Gospels. And Edersheim remarked about this would have been the time Jesus, it would have been the only time where Jesus would have had such an opportunity to say what he did in John chapter 8, verses 12 through 59. So this is what he said, and I'll just read you some of it. Jesus' startling teaching on the great day of the Feast of the Tabernacles was not the last one delivered at that same season. The impression left on the mind is that after the Pharisees thought they had silenced Nicodemus, remember he said, do we judge a man before we hear him? Uh, they think that after they silenced Nicodemus that they all dispersed. Yet the messages of Jesus that follow in chapter 8 <clears throat> must have been delivered either later on that same evening, which after sundown would have been the beginning of the octave or the eighth day, so after sundown would have been the beginning of the octave of the tabernacle feast season. On this eighth and final day of the highest feast season, the temple and all of its environs would have still been thronged with worshipers. Most of this message was delivered by the temple treasurer, which is in the lavishly colonnaded court of women, which was nearest the court of the Gentiles. Now, this is all part of the temple complex. This area was the most popular place for teaching to be given. The Talmud reveals that every night of the festive week, the court of women was brilliantly illuminated to express the rabbinic hope of the Messiah coming as the light of the nations. He says it is too small, and I, read, or I quoted that. And then there was a special brilliance furnished on the eighth day and final day of the feast season. So it would have been in this setting that Jesus would have stepped forth and declared, 
I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall have the light of life. And you can just imagine with everybody there and knowing the significance of those great candelabras, for Jesus to step forth and to boldly proclaim, look at, look at John chapter 8, verse 12 here, because this is where he started his message. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the, dar- the darkness, but will have the light of life. So this was another powerful and tremendous claim to be the Messiah and to the uh, to the Jewish religious people they knew the significance in a special way of what he was saying because they knew the significance of what they were celebrating what had been celebrated for centuries and they knew that Jesus was seizing upon that to say you're looking for the light that would shine upon the world and shine upon the Gentiles. I am that light. And if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness. Can't you imagine the atmosphere of that? First of all, it was an exciting time. People were there because they were really excited about being part of this joyous celebration time of the year. But also, there was the intrigue of the whole crowd knowing that the religious leaders were seeking to kill Jesus. They were looking for any opportunity to seize him and to put him to death. However, they knew the crowds would not tolerate it, so they tried to find a sneaky way to do it. And that plot was going on constantly. And yet, here bold is a lion of Judah. He steps forth and proclaims to be the fulfillment of this elaborate celebration that was looking for the Messiah to come and be the light of the world. In verse 13, though, we see the hardness of the Pharisees. So the Pharisees said to him, you're testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. See, they were looking for any little picky unish thing to lay on him to say, you're you're." You're a false prophet. And the reason is because you're testifying of yourself. So they pick a little fine point out of the law. Instead of listening to the evidence and looking at the evidence he's presented, he's presented all the credentials the prophets predicted the Messiah would would show them. They're looking for anything not to believe it. And so the growing animosity is... It really gets vicious in this chapter. And Jesus becomes bolder and bolder the more vicious they get. So they pick up this point. And then in verse 14, Jesus answers that. He said, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I came from or where I'm going. So he he claims to have perfect self-awareness of where he came from and where he's going. And he said, but you don't have a clue where I came from and where I'm going. Now that's significant when you put it in the context of what he just claimed. He said, I'm the light of the world. I'm the Messiah that you are praying for. I'm here. And... So these people absolutely uh, just refuse to get it. In verse 15, now here's where Jesus starts really taking the gloves off. He says, you judge according to the flesh. Now that would be really uh, something that would uh, infuriate these uh, scholars and they claim to know all about the spiritual. And he says, you, you simply judge of the flesh. And he says, I'm not judging anyone. But even if I were to judge, my judgment is true. For I'm not alone, but I am the Father who sent me. 
See, he knew they were using the point from the law of Moses that uh, you had to have the testimony of two people in order to establish something to be true. So he says, okay, you want to use the law? Try this on. I'm one who's testifying, and my father who sent me is also backing me up and testifying. Now, they knew exactly what he meant when he says, my father. He's saying, God. I and God are the two witnesses that you need. And I and God are a majority. So he's, he's taking the gloves off. As a matter of fact, let me read to you some of the things he says about these Jewish religious leaders in this, uh, in this, uh, in this chapter. First of all, he says in verse 15, you judge according to the flesh. And that would have really driven them wild. Then the next thing he said, you do not know either me or my father, verse 19, which means you don't know me and you don't know God. You are from below. <laughs> so he's saying, you know, you're, you're from below and you have no idea what's above. He says, I am from above. And then he says, you are of this world, cosmos in the Greek, which means the world system. You are part of this world system. The next thing he says, and this is, that was in verse 23, and verse 24 he says, you're going to die in your sins. Now you can't imagine how this would have absolutely infuriated those pompous religious leaders. I mean, it's like waving a red flag in front of a wild bunch of bulls. Then he says, in the sixth, the sixth thing he said, you do the things which you heard from your father. Verse 40. Then the seventh thing he said about them, you are of your father the devil. And let me give you what the Greek literally says. And you passionately lust to constantly do his will. Those are the words he used. And the eighth thing he said to him in this chapter, you do not hear my words because you're not of God, verse 47. And then the ninth thing he said in verse 55, if I say that I do not know him, God, I will be a liar like you, verse 55. That just gives you a kind of a flavor of what's going to happen here. I mean, Jesus, they got angrier and angrier and more vicious, and Jesus just got more bold. They raised the tempo, he'd go about five octaves above them. See, Jesus was not please tread on me kind of guy. There's a lot of things revealed about Satan here, and as we go through, we'll see Satan becomes a very important factor in this chapter. But uh, he, he, uh, he revealed that Satan was the father of lies and the source of their blindness. This is what the scripture says about Satan in chapter 2, verse 1 of Ephesians. It says that Satan is the prince of the power of darkness. Well, how that contrasts with what Jesus just claimed. I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness. He also said that Satan is the prince of the power of the air, literally of the atmosphere. And he didn't mean just the air we breathe. He meant the atmosphere of thought in the world. It was used metaphorically. And in chapter 2, verse 1 of Ephesians, he also said, Satan is the spirit that now works in the unbeliever. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says that Satan is the god of this world 
who has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He is, you know, if someone doesn't accept Jesus, they don't want to hear about him or they hear about him and they reject it. You know who caused that? Satan. And the reason Satan can do it is because they are willing, whenever they refuse to accept Christ, they are willingly putting themselves under the power of darkness. And he blinds the mind of the unbeliever. That's why, you know, many times I, in, in uh, preaching the gospel, sharing Christ with people and so forth, I am amazed at how people with PhDs piled up behind them can be so blind. And yet I shouldn't be. Because, you know, coming to understand who Jesus is and coming to uh, the point where you will believe in him has nothing to do with your intelligence. Nothing. It has to do with Willingness to see objectively yourself as lost and incapable of doing anything that will earn God's acceptance. And secondly, to being open to say, God, if you're real, I want to receive you. That's, that's, that's what opens the way and shuts Satan out from blinding you. Finally, in the first John chapter five, verse 19, he said, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That's, that's scary, isn't it? The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now, that becomes very obvious and scary to me as time is passing by because those who reject Christ are getting much more vicious toward real Christians, toward real Christianity. And uh, you can see that the evil one is being released by God to express his power more in those who follow him. So remember that now. Let's go back to John chapter 8. Verse 16, Jesus said, but even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I'm not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me. Now, in this dialogue, there is no question in the minds of those hearing what he means when he says, my Father. He, they know he's claiming that God is his Father. They know that he is claiming that uh, the Father God sent him, and the Father God shows him what to say. So there's no, uh, there's no confusion in the mind of the people that are hearing this, especially the religious leaders. They knew what he was claiming. I, t I tell you, a lot of times, you know, I hear these uh, pastors and liberal pastors and theologians who say Jesus never claimed to be God. He never claimed to be uh, the Messiah. I wonder what Bible they're reading. I certainly don't know the historical background, that's for sure. And so he says in verse 18, I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. The response, so they were saying to him, where is your father? You see, this, this is the first inference of the charge that they have been throwing around, that he was illegitimate. So that the uh, syntax here, the tone of it would be, ha, where is your father? It would have been like that. So they were impugning and uh, they were already insinuating that he was a bastard child. But it gets even worse. Their, their uh, vicious charges against Jesus become terrible in this chapter. So they said, uh, where is your father? Jesus answered, 
you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. So here he's charging them. You don't know. You don't know my father. You don't know God. You claim to be God's chosen people, but you don't know God. And the reason is because I, the one he has sent, you don't accept. And that's why you don't know. Verse 20 says, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Now the treasury, you see, that's, that's a key that we want to hold on to. This is what Dr. Edersheim was talking about. The treasury was in the court of the women in the colonnaded area there, and it was brilliantly lit there. That's where they taught, and this is where the, the brightest of the candelabras were. And it was also very close to the court of the Gentiles, so that all the Gentiles who came inquiring about the God of Israel could hear him. And he was aware of that. Join us next week for the continuation of How Lindsay's Bible Study of the Book of John. But when you really get a grip on the fact that Jesus so saves you, when you simply admit your sins and receive the gift of pardon, that you are already in heaven as far as he's concerned. As I prepared for this week's program, I was again struck by the speed with which events are moving into the scenario the prophets predicted for the end times. I believe we're there. People on the street are talking about what all of these things mean. Folks that wouldn't darken the door of a church or pick up a, a Bible are now very curious. This may be our greatest opportunity, maybe even our last opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ before we're silenced by political correctness. The message that God has given me is more important now than it's ever been for the church and for the nation. That's why I'm asking you to help me to expand our reach. You can find more of Hal Lindsey at his website, www.howlindsey.com. There you can access our video and article archives, Visit our online store for Hal Lindsey CDs, books, and other specialty items. Hal Lindsey's comprehensive teaching on the Gospel of John is now available as an audio book. This incredible teaching will enrich your personal study of the book of John and enhance your understanding of the nature and character of Jesus Christ. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries. P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit howlindsay.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.